And although I like to think we have some pretty smart people in this building, it sure is a hell of a lot easier to just be first. Sell it all today. Welcome to The Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, September 30th, 2022. S&P 500 currently sitting at 3644. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with Pratty, Party Boy, Tulsian, Kevin, Bob, Vila, Ferrari. Dan Sinbagote, Gorkuber, and Ian Hurricane McMillan. A collective nickname would be the A Team. One of the reasons why I wanted to have all of you guys on is because we are at, currently in the market at one of the bigger inflection points. It's an overused term, but pretty large inflection point worth having you all on. What I wanted to talk about is there's plenty of information market wise for the bearish thesis, right? We work, we operate in thesis. So we have an idea. This is what the market's going to do. Potentially price has to confirm that we would all have plenty of ammunition to come into this podcast and say, here are the things that are bearish, right? We have stocks down double digits everywhere. Selling pressure hasn't debated going into this week, currently sitting at important levels on something like the S&P 500 broken important levels when we look at other metrics like the NYA, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, things like equal weighted S&P 500 RSP. So there's plenty of things that point towards the bearish thesis. What I'd like to challenge our listeners with right off the bat by bringing you all on here are what are the things that we'd like to see from a bullish perspective? What would support a bullish thesis from this point forward? And what I'd like to do is kind of go through each one of you. So I'll, I'll go with Pratty, then Kevin, then Dan, then Ian. What would you guys be looking at to see some type of bullish thesis confirmed? So Pratty, I'll start with you. What are some things that you're looking at when you think about, man, this is what I'd really like to see, to see a return to risk on behavior or a return to buying equities and uh, an abatement of the selling pressure that we've seen? Yeah. So, you know, when a bottom forms, no one really knows at the time whether it's the bottom or maybe it's just a counter trend move. You know, like earlier this month, we saw a three, four day counter trend move. And then in June, July, we saw something that lasted months, you know, but there's always evidence that we can look at to, you know, help us determine whether this is something that could be a sustainable move. And one of the pieces that I'm looking at is the ratio of Russell 2000 versus the S&P. So, if you pull up a chart of IWM versus SPX, you'll see that this is kind of forming a neckline going back to the start of the year. And, you know, so one scenario that I'd kind of like to see is maybe we undercut the June lows and then, you know, and the undercut doesn't have to happen. But what's important is we reclaim or we're above the June lows again. And then we see this ratio break out and we get that breadth thrust. And I think that would certainly warrant looking at putting on some risk. So you're saying it's, there would be uh, two things happening in, in concert. You would see something like the S&P 500 hold its June lows or reclaim its June lows, which is around 3666 on the S&P 500. In conjunction with that, you would see IWM or, or the Russell 2000 or small caps outperform to the upside the S&P 500. That could potentially be a scenario where you're seeing ex- expansion, participation, and risk on behavior. Is that a is that a pretty good summary? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And I think like another piece that's kind of, you know, that fits in really well with that is if you look at Apple versus S&P, like, I guess you could say Apple's kind of been the safety trade, at least for tech, right? Everybody's been piling into that. And now this week, it's a pretty sharp relative drawdown. And so maybe maybe that's the beginning of that, you know, final piece that Apple is as it falls over at the end of the bull market. And well, I guess you could say, you know, with the stage analysis, Apple was the final thing that's holding up. And now even that's getting hit, that would support, you know, IWM moving higher on a relative basis, whether that is to the upside or to the downside, you know, that's yet to be um, seen. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and 
and to the listeners out there, let it be known that we could barely get through one bullish thesis without identifying that we kind of have a bearish confirmation with Apple breaking down on a, well, I shouldn't say breaking down, potentially a false breakout on a relative basis versus things like the S&P and small caps. But your point is valid, Pratty, that if we were to see a return to demand outpacing supply in stocks, you would see something like Russell 2000 versus the S&P, a ratio move higher. Although the argument could also be made that one is just falling less than the other. So very good stuff there, Pratty. Kevin, how about you? What are you looking at? What are some things that you're thinking about from a, this is the things we kind of would like to see from a bullish thesis perspective? Yeah. So I think when you think about it in like a sector rotation kind of mindset, I mean, really kind of what's been holding up well, at least recently has been kind of your energy and materials space. Okay. Um, And I mean, I guess if you follow along, Kind of the sector rotation chart, you'd kind of expect those to kind of start cooling off before you really started forming a bottom. And I guess you could, if you look at materials like IYM, you've kind of already seen that happen, like especially a break below like the 110 area. If it can hold below there and kind of maybe even move lower, which you've kind of already seen so far, at least as of now, I mean, that's kind of a good start. But energy is still continue to hold up well. Um, like I said, kind of look for that to maybe start going off and kind of more follow what materials has done just to kind of start moving along kind of the sector rotation path. If energy is weakening and materials are weakening, what you're saying is then you'd like to see that, that, that capital yeah. rotate into things like the most hard hit areas like right. tech and communication services into growth names. That's what you're talking about is if we see those things move down, you'd want to see the other things move up. Right. You can kind of make the case that we're starting to get hints that it's happening. So like one thing I like looking at is DMI with the ADX. So you can see like, especially on XLE and really kind of have a similar look on the energy materials, but you're getting a DMI minus cross above the positives. And now ADX is kind of put in a bottom and start moving higher, which would lead you to believe if that continues that a kind of a more negative trend would start to strengthen, which yeah, could be and, foreshadowing. And, I guess it's hard to say if that actually plays out. So to simplify it for, because Kevin's now upon his CMT designation, to simplify it for a non-technician, what Kevin's talking about, there's an ADX indicator that just gives us a, a idea of trend strength. And Kevin, if I can, you're describing that things like energy and materials are starting to see the positive trend strength decline while the negative trend strength increase using an indicator like ADX. Right. Yep. And so if those two are two, those two areas, energy and materials, now energy is the only positive sector year to date. So a great outperformer. However, it's had its own correction from the highs. I think we get a, that's pretty simple to see that it, it's corrected since about early June. Now, what you'd want to see, Kevin, is if we're going to do that, if we're going to have energy and materials sell off, that then we would see a positive development out of things like growth and tech. Mm-hmm. So now that's to be determined, right? There's two scenarios. Maybe energy and materials are going to catch down to what everything else has been doing without the rotation and attack, which would be more for the bearish thesis. But if we see higher growth areas or higher beta names move to the upside, that could be a potential bullish thesis scenario. Right. Yeah, it just kind of helps, I guess, narrow in on things to watch, too. I mean, it, it doesn't have to happen that way. Um, <laughs> Wait, would be- the, market, the market doesn't have to happen the way we want it to? No, it'd be nice. Oh, man. Uh, we just follow along on the playbook and make it a lot easier. Yeah, why don't they just draw this out for us? No, good stuff there, Kevin. Uh, Dan, how about you? What are you looking for from a bullish thesis perspective? You know, challenging our thought processes, right? Because everything's, I mean, many, many pieces are being checked for the bearish thesis. How about for you? What are you looking at from a bullish thesis standpoint, things that you'd like to see? Yeah, I think part of that thesis would would probably fall into the uh, just overall bond complex. 
a lot of focus this year, of course, is on just bonds, rates, and, and really where a lot of that outside noise potentially can go. But at the same time, you know, it's the bond complex in and of itself is where a lot of the smart money lies, right? So, you know, it, it would be nice to see some of that trend within the bond complex. So treasuries, high yield corporates start to really change that trend uh, before we can get really too too excited about anything. So, you know, so this one, goes this goes along the lines of that credit, the credit market knows more than the equity market. That's your, that's kind of what you're alluding to here. Yep. Yep. And something like LQD, so liquid corporates being like your high grade investment. What I mean by that is these are credit instruments that don't have a high risk of default, potentially. I mean, all things have a risk of default, but these would be your high yield or your not high yield, but your investment grade yield type bonds. Something like LQD being below 111, that's not really great. You're saying that if we reclaim something like that, that would be a positive development from a credit standpoint. I don't yeah, want to put absolutely. words in your mouth, in your mouth, yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. Anything to, I mean, 111, um, even just being above like probably like 105, 106 on okay. LQD um, in like the very near term. I think even just looking at like, just something like the 10 year notes. And this is more on the future side of things, but just looking at the 10 year notes, they seem to be performing a little bit better this week. And, you know, from a weekly perspective, a lot of these prints this week uh, look very similar to uh, the June 13th week. Um, okay. Or earlier this summer. Okay. And so what's, what's interesting about that is that, you know, that week equities closed pretty ugly. I don't know. I don't think they were on the lows, but they were, you know, you know, these right, right off the lows, let's call it. Right. And then obviously we can see kind of what transpired with the next few weeks beyond that. But, you know, a lot of work left to do, obviously, and it's something that we'll just continue to monitor. But yeah, just seeing a trend change would be, would be just nice to see in, in the bond market from a complex perspective, which then would, of course, maybe, maybe bleed over to the to some of this currency stuff as well, but uh, no, I think that's a good point because you're you're when you say bond complex, right? Uh, some people might like imagine a fortress, but what you're just saying is like anything from treasuries to corporates to junk bonds to international, yeah. all these different areas of credit, which are trillions of dollars, seeing them stop falling <laughs> would yeah. be one one positive because there there has been pretty big carnage. And this goes back to the 60-40 portfolio. Yeah, 60-40 portfolio. I mean, correlation to one, everything coming to one um, that, that I know we've harped on for quite a bit this year, kind of falling all into that same bucket where if we can start to see some of that trend shift, uh, that would be, you know, that would be something maybe. Well, I, th- I think that's a great point because bonds were supposed to be the offset, meaning offset, meaning offsetting anything, any corrective behavior going on within equities. So you sit up a set up a portfolio that's 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And here we have a scenario where, for example, treasuries are down 30% year to date. So almost down more than stocks. And okay. so the the investor hasn't been protected with a risk, what's called that was called a risk parity, right? Something they would teach in modern portfolio construction that this is what you should do for your clients, right? We it's it's interesting that certain regulatory bodies would say, you know, tr- treasuries are less risk than stocks. In fact, I, I believe that's in the Series sixty five exam. And here we have a scenario where that that might be breaking. And do you have a process for identify when that's breaking? And so I really appreciate what you're bringing up here is that the credit markets have not been immune to the corrective behavior we've seen all year. In fact, in some cases, worse. And all we would like to see from a bullish perspective is for that to stop. Yeah. And maybe it will. You know, there, there's something called a hammer candle, which just means some type of reversal candle. Maybe we're going to see that in some of the areas out there as of right now. Maybe you're seeing that in international bonds. Maybe you're seeing that in something in the most common ETFs out there for the bond complex, AGG. 
maybe we're seeing a hammer taking place. But your point is valid. We want to stop seeing uh, sellers have control in the bond complex. Uh, great point there. Ian, how about you? What do we want to, what are we looking for here? Because all the markers seem to point to this bearish thesis. Can we keep an open mind on what the bullish thesis would look like? How about you? What are you looking for in this environment? So I think those are all great responses from the team. 100% agree with them. For me, I would like to see, now I'm going to put an asterisk next to this because I would say we had some pretty good breath thrust in July and August. So is this like a Barry Bonds home run ball? We're putting an asterisk. Uh, yes. So I think on the next breath thrust, still, at least for me, there's still going to be some skepticism. No, walk me through that. that but I, I think I, it, I think at the bottom line, it goes down to price. Obviously, 39 100 is some type of start that and you are. And you're using the S&P 500 for that, 3,900? Mm -hmm. Okay. 3,900. If we can get back above that, that kind of builds the case that, yes, stocks continue, are continuing to try to build out some type of bottom. I don't know if I'd be super convinced until we're back up above 4180 again at that point if stocks were to go back above 4180 i believe depending on what path it took to get there that that would probably also put you up above the 200 day i i would go on a limb and assume that let's say we get to november or december and we're at 4,200. Okay. Depending on, you know, the velocity of that move and what that does to the last 200 day average, right? Because if that takes two weeks or it takes three months to get there, that's going to change the 200 day moving average. But I think once you get there, that would put you from a price behavior perspective. I think that gives you like some open, some open air to move higher yeah no it's a math problem or or it's just a number problem you have the only way you get to 4180 is through 3900 and the only way you get through a, a, a 200 day is understanding where the 200 day is on a on a chart and so at this current level we're currently trading at 36 41 4180 the 200 days about 40 240 and yeah you could come i mean 3900 if the, if we're not going to get a waterfall event like october 2008 we can talk about more about kind of september 2008 i think we had had a good discussion on that this morning as a team and you know breath at washout levels and things like that but does this just turn into a choppy downwards move, kind of like you saw in the dot-com bubble? I mean, there were lows taken out and recaptured, and then lows, and these are big moves. These are 30, 40% rallies. Yeah. Um, and You're talking about the dot-com yeah, and, and they're big behavior levels that get recaptured. And then sometimes a month or two, sometimes multiple months later, they're failing. And is that just the type of headache you could see going forward? Bear markets are, are rarely clean. And to your point, I actually I actually like that you brought this up because it wasn't intentional, but I, I, I interrupted a thought process of yours uh, last week, which was basically along the lines of bear markets are all different. And one scenario, obviously recency bias, brings us to the 2007 to 2009 great financial crisis uh, bear market and how we're tracking along with that. And you bring up 
you know, the dot com. And those are the those are the two most recent big time corrections. Now we've had our our fair share of twenty. And you had 20. eighty to eighty two as right. I put that in the same category of just constantly breakdowns to new lows that within weeks are taken back. And I mean, how many trips to the two hundred? We had one, two, three trips, four trips to the two hundred day, and a three year. You know what is this thirty percent decline? No, I love that. Messy. Yeah, it's super messy, and it and it's and it's never easy. You know, going back to your dot com bust bear market of the two thousands and two thousand one was actually when I began my career in markets. But you had three different rallies, bear market what what we now know as bear market rallies of twenty plus percent. That brought us back to the 200 falling 200 day moving average. And like you said, reclaimed prior lows. So reclaiming prior lows, while yes, that's a good bullish thesis, right? Because it's a it's simple math, it doesn't give us the all clear. Because we could reclaim the June lows, for example, in something like SP, and subsequently then roll back over. And that's that's why we use price. And as you alluded to, Ian, every bear market is different. You've given good examples of that. And we've talked a little bit about the 200-day moving average. And the, the reason why I wanted the whole team on here is I, I want you to, the listeners, to listen to this. Listen to all these very qualified, very smart individuals talk in an objective manner about risk management. And this is what we are bringing to bear for our clients. And it makes my heart go pitter patter because each one of you brings this expert knowledge to the table and it's super appreciated. And where I want to pivot to now is we've talked, you know, we've heard the 200 day moving average brought up here. Can we talk a little bit as a group about the 200 week moving average? Ian, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, I mean, it's been a good barometer of larger trends in the market, especially the last, for sure, the, this past, ah, what do we call it? 13 years off the bottom, really, a lot of market technicians are going to say the bull market started in 2013. And I would agree with that, actually. But so off of the 2009 lows, we've had some big, big bottoms off of a 200-week moving average. So you had, I believe it was 2011, obviously a pretty messy time. I remember that was, you know, the double dip recession talk. Yeah, that was the S&P downgrade of treasuries. Yep. For sure. You had the 2016 low, so right from 2015, 2016, you moved sideways. In really 2014 to 2016, you moved sideways into this moving average. Uh, the Christmas Eve 2018 lows, right off the 200-week moving average. COVID lows, we did get through there, and then right now sitting just on top of them. We've bounced here over the last couple of days. This is where we seem to be trying to trying to put in some buying support. The 200 week moving average on something like the S and P 500 is currently at like 3590. Mm -hmm. And we appear to be holding that right now. And some good bottoms in the past black. I mean, we had the 87 sell off ended. 200 day right moving average the 1990 sell off also and and a lot of it and I mean these are October some of these are consistent of well, finding bottoms in October I think it's a fair thing to look at because if Paul Tudor Jones can tell us that nothing good happens underneath a 200 day moving average which so far this year has been a true statement how much more so then is price below a 200 week moving average? Because what if we don't hold a 200 week moving average, what have we seen in the past? 
It's and that, rough. And, and David and David Seta will tell you that's another a very another great CMT with a great great consistent process. He'll tell you that's really when bear markets start. That's when things get messy, yeah. like really messy is below a 200. And I have a ton of respect for David Settle. Like you said, very consistent process. And we had got there June of 08 was the first. And then you can say February 01, there was a rally there that recaptured it. So if you want to say June 01 was kind of the confirmed break. So we're, yeah. we are sitting right there. We're right, right, and on something like S and P. And what's interesting, and I, I know Kevin, you were highlighting this earlier today, is when we look at other instruments that are like broad instruments, like uh, I'll use equal weight S and P as an example. Are we seeing everything above their two hundred week moving average, or are there some things that are uh, similarly right there or below it? Kevin, you you willing to take that on? I'm kind of putting you on a spot here. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I know the one we were kind of talking about before was like NASDAQ using Qs. I mean, if you know, the S&P is close, but really the Qs are literally right on it right now and kind of they're flirting if you look at it weekly. I mean, they've kind of broken below it. And then in you know, a couple hours, we'll find out where that ends up. So you're saying that the, that the NASDAQ 100 using QQQ, the ETF mm-hmm. for the NASDAQ 100, could close below on a weekly time frame the 200 week moving average for the first time basically time. maybe since 2010 and for sure since 2008 yeah i mean that's that's a pretty big deal i mean it's it's uh put up or shut up at this point for the market so there were yeah there were a couple closes there i'm using a simple moving average in the late 09 like three days and yes. Yep. Never really. No, I think it's a great point. And, and we, point. we've got other things that have already broken that. What's interesting is, is Pratty at the, at the beginning talked about appropriately. So the relative strength out of small caps that we've seen recently. And here you have IWM, which does have a propensity to, from time to time, break below the 200 week moving average and then move higher. We are below that. This is the second strike, right? In June, we broke below the 200 week moving average in in small caps using IWM. And here we are again, the second week below the 200 week moving average. This is where puke type, capitulation type bear market behavior happens. And so it it is interesting to note that NYA, uh, the New York composite, which yeah. you know, tr- also second week below a 200 week moving average. Below yes. its COVID highs, below its June low. I mean, right. You know, the 14,000 level on may, I mean, 14,100. Or what's we're going to call 14,000 for the sake of simplicity. I think, I mean, if you're below that, it's, I think things are remain dicey. Yeah, no, and and this goes back to you know everybody's got different data points on when you're below a 200-day moving average, but David Settle is correct. When you get below a 200-week moving average, that's when things can get unraveled pretty quick. Yeah, that's and, when the seriousness happens, I would say. And and so why don't we just have the plane on the ground rather than try to to fly at a level where we're carrying on ice, like. What, let's just have a risk management process. Let's have a pro because cash is a position too. And that's a phrase or a tactic that sometimes gets lamented on, right? Because of quote unquote market timing, et cetera. But I tell you what, it's it's better to be on the ground in a plane wishing you were in the air than the other way around. Like nobody wants to be in the plane wishing they were on the ground. And here we are in a scenario. And again, we could look I've been, back. I've been in the plane wishing I was on the ground. Oh, amen, brother. I still remember the flight I was on where the right engine went out. And that's not a great feeling. And similarly with client portfolios, why do we need to take that risk? 
below a 200 week moving average, we don't need to be involved because prior really, really detrimental periods of market history happened below a 200 week moving average. Again, we, we could look back at this podcast six, 12, 18 months from now, and we move higher and we're perfectly okay with that because we have a game plan for that. As Ian talked about, 3,900, 4,180, we can be above those levels and, and participate. So you guys did an amazing job highlighting what, what we would be looking for from a bullish thesis. For me, uh, and I know I'm going to give my, my two cents here, even though I wasn't asked, but we're sitting on a, a stacked pile of firewood. Of, there's a lot of people short this market from a put call, from puts being bought, puts being things that are uh, a bet that prices fall further. There's a, there's a high number of those. Bullish percent. So stocks participating are at what we would call washout levels, looking at New York Stock Exchange bullish percent. However, those are not buy signals. Those are That's just environmental information. We've seen those type of metrics, put call ratio and bullish percent, stay at the levels that they're at for long times in really bad bear markets. So we don't know if this is going to be a really bad bear market. But right now, price can only dictate whether it's going to be or whether it's not going to be. And if we're going to remain below a 200-week moving average and have these scenarios in place, yes, maybe there's a counter-trend rally. As Ian was talking about before, the dot-com bust, we had three 20-plus percent rallies. We're open to that. That can happen. But the bearish thesis remains. So with that, I do want to kind of touch base on some of these other things, the notable events this week that took place that listeners and clients and prospects should be aware of. And I guess where I want to kick it off is when we think of the evidence for what's building below a 200 week moving average, it's not just a stock market, right? When we refer to the S&P 500, it's a market of stocks. What are we seeing from individual names, important individual names over the past week or month? One that comes to mind is, at least for this week in particular, touched on a little bit earlier, Apple having an abysmal week. I mean, the last, and really that weekly chart is pretty. And it was, I would say it was, it was followed through off was a pretty bad upper shadow on last week's candle. Obviously, other FANG stocks like Google, Facebook, Nike. Nike took a big hit today. That's not good for retail. You got Carnival Cruise Lines. You know, the cruise lines and airlines got so much attention during COVID. Uh, the stocks, obviously the companies, but the stocks as well. They're a huge barometer as to like, is the economy opening back up? Carnival Cruise Line is below its COVID lows. Yeah. To its lowest level in 30 years. Isn't that amazing? So you continue to see individual, I mean, and then if we want to bump it up a level, semiconductors below their COVID lows. Transports are down there with your uh, New York Stock, like NYA Composite and Value Line. They've been below their lows. So lots of, for lack of a better phrase, economically sensitive yeah. areas, lots of prior leaders. Now again, Bitcoin still has not broken. But yeah, I mean, looks pretty, pretty rough out there. Big names like Adobe. Yeah, Adobe is a huge one. Like, AD, uh, advanced or um, ADM. Like Adobe was one of the high correlation upside names with the market. Or AMD, I'm sorry. Yeah. And Adobe's broken down. I mean, it. It's a pretty dire situation where. There's so much selling pressure to get out of that stock. What about staples rolling? I mean, staples breaking their neckline. 
So now you've got defensive areas. So you're using like XLP at the 69 level, like 68, yeah, XLP, 94. 68, 69. I mean, this goes back to November. I mean, this goes back two years almost. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty big breakdown on, on a defensive area. I mean, and you took, I mean, a great example under the surface that is look at Coca-Cola. Uh, I just don't think this is what you want to see from stocks where people, if they wanted to, I mean, this is where you would, uh, it's kind of your last year last. To me, yeah. I know we talk about Apple. That's a different kind of phenomenon going on there. But these are the Alamo stocks. This is where you go to hide out and try to withstand the siege is in things like Coca-Cola things like staples and seeing something like XLP or even XLU. Like when you look at utilities, pretty big breakdown. I mean, this is just, we're on two weeks of, I don't think that had a green, I don't think they have a green day in two weeks. And those are, those are supposed to be the safety trade. So here you have Adobe, which was like the, uh, a poster child of a tech stock doing well. Then you have uh, a stock like Okta, which is supposed to be your high growth, high tech type name. But then you have your your bellwethers like FedEx and Nike and Taiwan Semiconductors. Yeah, FedEx, I mean, that's gap down. And I mean, and they're not even trying. There's no interest in seeing FedEx gap down 20% and people saying, oh, my gosh, this looks like a value. Like, this is a great value. It's just led to more selling. Right. No one wants to step in front of the train. And going back to your point of do we get to the capitulation waterfall moment? I mean, part of me feels like with the price action and some of these stocks that were tapping on that door. No, no, exactly. And it's across the board. You know, we talk about breath and participation and we've seen this sloshing of breath and yes we have washout data but we've seen in the past right because we're market historians we're not just going to look at the past two years of data we're going to look at the market as a whole we're going to go back 50 years longer 100 years and we're going to look at what are some because right it guess what don't know if you know this but adobe didn't exist in 1940 but things like RCA did. And so you have this environment where previous market high flyers are now breaking down and being sold hard. Like get me out hard. Like, like I don't want to own this anymore by institutions. And if you have an area like semiconductors, which is digital transportation breaking down along with physical transportation, IYT breaking down, I was, you know, we're trying to start the podcast with what the bullish thesis is, but there's not a lot to look at from. And then you got your story stocks, like your Roku's, um, yeah, that just cannot find any buyers out there. Well, yeah, and I get it, and like, right, we see the divergence. Like everyone sees, it's just continued selling. Well, and Roku using Roku. Think about think about this. It is below the COVID lows. Yeah, I mean that's that that's a big pre- tell. I mean another big name out of COVID, Teladoc. New yeah. up this week. It's been consolidating since late April ish. Broke to new lows. So now, do you see a whole nother round of selling where they go back to these small cap growth names? They've consolidated for four or five months. Right. Well, I think of something like XITK, which is the mm-hmm. spider innovative tech, and that's below uh, the May and June lows. It's already been discounted or the price has dropped, you know, 60 some percent. I mean, the on XITK, 78, 79 bucks looks like a magnet to me. And that's still 20% to go on something that's already dropped 60%. And so these, like you said, the story names, the work from home names, the high growth tech names continue. Like you said, they've been consolidating basically since 
you know, the first end of the first quarter. And here are we seeing this uh, another leg lower and going back to Kevin's original thought process of like, do we see energy and materials rotate down? We would need to see things like this rotate, like see demand and we're not. And I guess at, at this point, I, I'd like to pivot and bring Dan and, and Kevin back in because they've been so nice uh, listening to us pontificate. Kevin and Dan, when we when we look at, we've been talking stocks a lot here. Can we make a combination of stocks and commodities and talk a little bit about precious metals, gold miners? What are we seeing in that area of the market? Right, because gold was gold is supposed to be this inflation hedge. We've had high inflation. Walk me through what we're seeing out of gold miners, gold, those type of things. Yeah, well, I mean, it, especially this week. I mean, the miners have, I mean, been best performers, right? I mean, when you look at like GDX, GDXJ, like silver miners, junior miners. I mean, it, they've been performing well, and especially gold. Like I'm looking at gold right now. It, I mean, really, it's been getting beat up pretty well, but like especially on a weekly, weekly, excuse me, if you look at gold below 156, I mean, we're kind of starting to retest that now to where, I mean, maybe it's in play again. I mean, it's kind of early, I think, to tell, but you're definitely starting to kind of see some life out of that area, uh, which we so haven't you, really for a while. You're using GLD for that. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're using futures, maybe we would say if we reclaim 1700. There's some type of potential false breakdown on our hands. So not out of the woods, but more in play than they have been in the past. Is that a fair? Yeah, exactly. And so wouldn't that be interesting to finally see gold and gold miners pick up? When you would have expected it to be the case for what, months now? Right. But Which meanwhile, means? yeah, meanwhile, we've seen gold futures drop 20% along with everything else during this phase of quote unquote high inflation. And also, you know, gold can be viewed as a safe haven mm -hmm. and it hasn't been. I think that actually kind of leads into something I was thinking about just kind of listening to this, which I think kind of this point I'm about to make might be kind of obvious if you work in the industry, but like you usually, like we usually tend to talk about like these different markets or asset classes kind of by themselves, right? But really these asset classes like equities, bonds, you know, cash, commodities, they don't really exist in silos um, or by themselves. Like we were talking about sector rotation before. I mean, really you have asset class rotation too that we're kind of watching. Money in equities just doesn't stay in equities, right? It can flow into cash if you have broad selling. Um, it can flow into like some of these safer haven precious metals, right? I mean, it, these things don't just exist by themselves. So it kind of helps to take a step back and really look at all of these together. Because like when we were talking about bonds before too, I started looking at like AGG to the S&P. And you can okay. look at that in whichever order you want. But really that's starting to approach kind of some interesting levels there. I mean, we're probably weeks, maybe even a month or two away to where you could see that start kind of maybe potentially seeing like a breakout if you're looking at AGG versus the S&P. Which would be pretty risk off is, right. your, is your point. Yeah, and if, if you pair that, right, we're just talking about gold and even the gold miners or just precious metals and precious metals miners. I mean, you start, you start getting into that weight of evidence mode, right, where you start seeing multiple boxes kind of start checking themselves potentially. And it really just kind of paints a bigger picture. No, I love that. You're just saying that that the world is a, a flow chart for capital. Assets are a flow chart for capital. And in environments, if, if we know that liquidity is a lifeblood of a market, asset allocators, those who are looking to put money to work in the billions and trillions of dollars, they're going to look for liquidity in a low or an illiquid world. And some of those areas would be bonds, gold, bonds, and more specifically, treasuries. And so the, it's going to be interesting to see if currency markets 
are some of the most liquid markets in the environment in the world. What are we seeing from a currency perspective, Dan, that's worth paying attention to? Because it has some ramifications. Now, there's some relationships that have bro- have relationships that have broken, such as the for the past 40 years, they would tell you when the dollar rises, bonds would rise. We haven't seen that all year. We've seen the dollar rise and bonds fall. But what are we seeing from a dollar or anything currency related that is worth letting our listeners know about? Yeah, I mean, you're still seeing some pretty strong trends, I would say, just within the dollar complex or uh, your dollar traded, you know, um, Dixie index. Um, as far as like longer term trends, and I mean, I know you're seeing some kind of shut off this week, just when you look at like a weekly print of that, but still kind of within and within an uptrend until we kind of take out probably that 109, 109 so t- area. Yeah. So you're talking about the DXY, the trade weighted index for the dollar. Yep. Pause, yep exactly. Pausing this week. And it's that's not necessarily the end of a uptrend in dollar which we pointed to 120 several times on here as being upside objective, 119, 120 for a trade weighted dollar. So that hasn't really, the dollar trade isn't necessarily over. It's not, um, I would say, you know, contextually it's not, I would say from like an execution perspective, right? Because an analysis execution, um, there is some fine line, you know, we talk a lot about like risk reward, so like your risk reward left in this potential trade is certainly, I would, or we would probably argue on the frisky side of just not like you're, if we're, if we're talking 120 on that, uh, you know, we're 112, we were upwards of 114 plus earlier this week. So, mm-hmm. you know, your, your potential risk reward out of that 120 level is, is certainly minimizing. But again, like we talked about, I mean, the trend is still pretty, pretty up and to the right. Um, yeah. And you know, that's what it's about. Monitoring. Yeah. Yep. And it, um, it's an interesting time because, and, and I want to be clear where I go to next with this, and this is open to, to all, all of you guys, is we all know that countries, let, like, let, let's not pretend that there's only one country that manipulates its currency. Okay. Let's start there. Point two it takes quite a different level to directly intervene in one's currency. So we're, we're, all the countries, all the economies over, across the globe are impacting their currency and manipulating it, but not directly. And here we have a situation just this last week of the Bank of Japan coming out. And again, I apologize. We're going kind of down a fundamental route here. But there's a point to this. They said we're directly intervening to suppress the dollar versus the yen. How's that going? Doesn't look like it's going very good. No. And Bank of England says it's directly intervening in their own credit markets to impact the pound. We've seen some rebound. I'd say it's going a little better, maybe. Maybe a little better. But here you have two G8 economies saying they're directly intervening to impact their currencies is the narrative that we have a sovereign issue on our hands too obvious? Ian, what do you think? I don't think, well, I don't know if anything's ever too obvious. That's a great, that, I like that. Not, nothing in markets is ever too obvious. I wish, I wish sometimes. Don't you wish are... it was obvious? Don't you wish it was like, I wish I would pay. I would pay so much money for it to be to, obvious. Yeah, to check all the boxes. Yeah, I would. But, but here you have a currency environment where the dollar remains strong. Yes, it's mm-hmm. pausing. You have central banks intervening directly. That don't seem. I mean, and these what these interve- the reactions from the intervention last. I don't know three two four days. Hours. Yeah. yeah, and two then. Days. Well, and I don't, and it goes back to the, I don't, can central banks fight or can central, can the central banks truly stop whatever forces are at play in a system this massive? Ian, 
that is the question of this pod. I love that because market's going to market. Yeah, I you, just and to think, think that these people who are wrong all the time, <laughs> they're wrong about every, these people told you there wasn't even going to be inflation. It was transitory, bro. Uh, yeah, it's right. And if you, I mean, if you've come to our lunch and learners, you've heard us hate on that for a few quarters now. Yeah, I, I mean, if the forces and the markets are gonna do what they want to do and i just don't think a bunch of people in suits in a room who again are a majority of the time just horrible when it comes to you know making economic decisions it seems or they're just you know doing it on right and that's the other side is they're doing it on purpose and we don't need to go down that rabbit hole on our podcast Or they're too late or they're like, like you said, like, it's very hard. Well, you have, so today I saw the right before we hopped on here, White House going to meet with oil producers. Crude's 40% off its highs. So I don't know what, like, like, why are we, why are we meeting with oil producers about? Is this a happy hour? Is that they're getting together and having? I, I assume so because there's nothing to talk. I mean, crude's at. I don't know, 74 bucks a barrel. Why weren't why weren't you concerned about that at 125, 120, 115? Right. 80 bucks. So we bounced. We were down to 74 earlier this week. We bounced. Well, that's and that's the part that drives you nuts is because it's it's political lip service. It is. And the beauty is in adaptive models, adaptive exactly. portfolios, we don't who care? Uh, we don't let politics in the portfolio. We're gonna just use price. And right now, regardless of the Bank of England, regardless of the Bank of Japan, when we look at the trends of the U.S. dollar on a trade-weighted basis, the trend remains up. Mm -hmm. The next resistant level remains 120. Do we see the dollar pause here? Absolutely. That makes sense. And that's fine. I think it's telling from a data standpoint that we had two pretty, I I don't want to make it sound substantial. Um. We had two days of trade weighted dollar weakness. And the narrative had been, well, as soon as we see that, equities will be fine. Equities will rip, yeah. And that's not what we've seen. We had no. we had two days of substantial dollar tra- on a trade weighted basis weakness, and <laughs> equities did nothing. So how weak are equities? And then the dollar, and then the dollar, and then they run for the hills again on. The dollar, I mean, a little bit of dollar strength today, it feels like. Right. And so it's. And we'll see again. Maybe we're carving at a bottom and we're going to we, continue to we, carve, 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 carve. Um, we could be because we're at that pivotal. I'll go back. I'll put us back to that 200 week moving average. This is a critical point. When we were having the discussion as a team this morning, and then I had thoughts about are we going to have the whole team on? One of the final pieces on why to have the whole team on is. Clients need to understand what we are bringing to bear because we are at a critical market environment, a critical market point right now. Like either we're about to have one of the biggest puke fests we've seen since 08, 09, or like you said, we're carving out a bottom. And we're going to let price dictate what that is. But the risk and reward ratio right now is about one to one. Yeah. from, From an evidence standpoint. I, I really like the way you phrased that because to me, that says it's not worth doing anything in either direction yet. Right. If your risk is one to one, that's a there's, coin. That's a coin flip. It's a coin flip. There, it's that's there's, not risk in your favor. You're not good. That's not an like. That's not. I have nothing to work against there. Right. It's one to one. It's 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 not asymmetric. It's symmetric. It's symmetrical. I, I I could take a, a like you said a coin flip. I could take a position one way or the other. You could be extremely short at this point, and it may work so it's out. Not, so you're saying it's not just the June lows; it's the 200 week moving average that is right. It's everything yeah. together. It's it's yes, we have washout on the on a participation basis, but washout can last. Washout can get really really bad. 
and and yes, we're at the June lows, but just because we're at the June lows doesn't mean like everything. I mean, yes, it's a level you can manage risk against, and I and I like that. But the two hundred week moving average below that, if I if I could amplify Paul Tudor Jones, who who says nothing good happens below a two hundred day moving average, I would say absolute carnage happens below a 200 week moving average which is really 200 week that's four years right so from a behavioral standpoint uh i mean that's four years of information four years of information four years of emotions well and 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 four years of looking at your account oh my god my account balance is back to where it was in 2018 like that type of stuff well, and what was four years ago? Oh my God, I've got to re- like I this can't get any worse. I'm gonna retire in five years. I like that is when you see it really kick in. And and four years ago was Volmageddon. That's when the vol the volatility instruments broke. Yeah. And and I don't mean to say that the VIX isn't working right now. I just mean the financial instruments that investors could invest in that were based on volatility measurements like the VIX broke. Mm. And I remember that. I think everyone does, but January 2018. And so this 200 week moving average looks back all the way through that point. And we're market historians, as I've said before, below a, a 200 week moving average. That's that's where really people do not want to own stocks. That's what it boils down to. Yeah. That's when people are done get, with it. And then you get it. I think that is when you go from like you the switch flips to there's no reason for me to mess around here and then Correct. you're going to hear a lot about well now that i can get something on my yield and i can get yielding something maybe i'll go buy this and i'll just take my seven or eight percent a year and some corporate bonds whatever it is i mean those probably aren't a rated corporate bonds but you know, there's there are a lot of more things come into play. It's a 13 year run. I'm not going to give this back. I'm sick and tired of it, right? Because most people have been watching. Indices have gone down since December. Most people have watched. If you've owned things like quote unquote stocks, been going down for 18 months at this point, close. No, yeah, yeah. If we're not if we're not getting myopic and just looking at the S and P 500 and Nasdaq. Well, Nasdaq's down thirty, but mm-hmm. you know everybody likes to look at the S and P. But if you look at the average stock underneath, yeah, absolutely. so it's not, like, it's not like investors are fed up after nine months of selling. This is eighteen months of selling, right? And I think we'd all make the argument that the puke fest doesn't happen, and it doesn't have to happen. Like that's that's the other thesis is it doesn't happen. That two hundred week, we can bounce, 200... we could rip, we could have a massive green bullish engulfing candle next week and we never we don't right. see the 200 day 200 week average for, for another for yeah for another six years who yeah. knows exactly and i'm open to that but first we got to reclaim 4180 on something like the s&p and you've got to see um horizontal levels stop breaking down on big names like nike which is a pretty big consumer discretionary name and a big institutional name and so you and or fedex or taiwan semiconductors these are big these names are blue chip liquid names and they're breaking down and so the the evidence continues to be for further downside again we're bayesian we'll let the data come in next week can be different but the risk reward scenario you have to be careful with it because Below a 200 week moving average, this is where things can accelerate to the downside. I have no idea if it's going to. Like you said, we could, this could be it. This podcast could mark. It could be 98 and and Adobe goes up 300% over the next two years. Right. And all Um, the, all the puts get, all the put buying gets exercised and they're buying stocks hand, hand over fist to cover. And we're sitting at new highs sometime in middle 2023. Here's the crazy part is if that scenario plays out, that doesn't even mean we're out of the woods. Some of the most dangerous downside market environments happen when the put buyers are done covering. 
So we'll see. So I we're kind of bumping up against the end of our our time here. Kevin and Dan have done done an excellent job providing their input. You know, while Ian and I have worked through some of these things, Pratty as well. So really good stuff today, guys. I appreciate all of you guys being on. And and the reason why I wanted to do it is I wanted our listeners, I wanted our clients, I wanted those who are considering working with us to understand the full weight of what this team brings in this type of environment, which is one of the most important environments that we've seen in the past few years. Even though we've had several 20 plus corrections over the last four years, which is abnormal when we look at what markets are abnormal to begin with, but we're at a pivotal point right now. And this team is ready to handle that by managing risk and reward. And so I appreciate all of you guys being on and bringing your knowledge to bear using price. Anything else you guys want to touch base on before we close this down? Uh, I would say um, continuing to watch European banks. Oh man, <laughs> um, that would that's a that's a risk on area that doesn't get as much attention, um, but they continue to look absolutely horrible. And this was an area that actually looked decent. I mean, if you take Deutsche Bank for an example, I mean. In mid February, Deutsche Bank was breaking to new highs above 15 bucks. We're now. Well, Credit Suisse, big company or not? I mean, big bank, big banking company or not? Matt, I mean, and again, I don't know largest banks in Europe. I don't know those off the top of my head. I know that it's got to be one of the largest. And here we're sitting at four bucks a share. Low prices don't necessarily mean great, great company. And so here we have a scenario where Credit Suisse is just rolling over hard. And like you said, Euro- European banks don't look great. And so what does that mean for Europe overall? Time will tell. Dan and Kevin, anything from you guys before we close it down? Uh, I guess end of quarter, end of month. Yeah. Well, do you, uh, what, what are you window dressing? What are you putting in the portfolio to make it look good <laughs> the clients on there, Dan? We got to make sure they know we own the strongest stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one one quarter left in twenty two. No, I don't. I don't really have much else. Just let's finish it strong. Yeah. Absolutely, Kevin. Yeah. I, don't know. I think I'm good. So All one right. way or another, we're about to find out, right? <laughs> awesome. And I and I know Pratty had to step away, but guys, I really appreciate it. I know it's hard to have a group on, uh, but you guys did a great job. I really appreciate it. We continue to manage risk. That's our number one priority. How we do it is with the adaptive system. So thank you for your you guys for your time. People who are listening to this, we love it when you give us a high ranking because that helps us get the word out, right? This information that we just provided from a bunch of guys who have a bunch of knowledge, whether it's through their licenses in the 65 series or whether they have their charter market technician designation, it's a lot coming to bear. We're not charging anything for this, but if you could give us a high ranking, we'd really appreciate it. With that, we'll sign off. Have a great weekend, everyone.